Five Rings Podcast. Road to Tokyo on the Sports Podcasting Network. Your weekly fix leading up to the 2020 Olympic Games with Dwayne Rollins and Kevin Laramie. Follow us and listen to us live on Twitter at Five Rings Podcast and like our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Sports Podcasting Network for more content. Good day, good night, and welcome to the Five Rings Podcast. I'm Kevin Larme, joined by Dwayne Rollins, as always. Dwayne, we're back looking at Olympic sports, amateur sports. Doha, the World Championships, is upon us. I'm having flashback. I'm having fun. This is what we're here for. Absolutely. This is, um, in many ways, this show today will be a dress rehearsal for those that are new to us to understand how our shows during major events happen uh, during the Olympics. When during the Olympics, for, if you don't know, we do go daily, um, maybe even plus daily in some cases. Certainly, we, we started on day minus two <laughs> for uh, Pyeongchang and uh, went through, of course, to the game the games plus one, basically, and, and did daily what we called our medals. So we do gold, silver, bronze medals each day. That's an overall sort of medal. And I think you all understand what a gold, silver and bronze medal means. Uh, but we don't necessarily restrict it to just um, performance. It can be, often is, but it can also be concepts. And you'll understand what we mean when we come to it. We also give what's called a wood medal. A wood medal is for our most disappointing aspect of the day. And again, not necessarily a, a performance. Can be, but not. Uh, it can be a concept. It can be a thing. And usually the wood medal often is a concept more than a performance because I don't really like to call out athletes unless they had something particularly go wrong. Um, and then uh, we also added during Pyeongchang, we added what we're calling the poutine medal. And that's because Kevin and I are, we're, this is a show that looks at the world but is uh, Canadian in its focus. So we'd like to sort of acknowledge our Canadian athletes because we follow them a little bit closer, Kevin. And I'm yep. excited to get down and have another medal show because they're they're the bread and butter of what Five Rings is all about. Also, our Canadian athletes outside of once every four years don't necessarily have a lot of a, of a big of a platform. So whenever we can, we'll try to, to talk about Canadian athletes. And, and quickly, can. if you don't know what poutine is, oh uh, it's God. something the athletes would never eat. <laughs> it's something I just had for lunch and I needed a nap after. All right, before we get into our medals, though, uh, how was your first five days of watching the World Championship from Doha? What, what's your overall thought watching a few competitions? Uh, not necessarily any spoilers for your medals, but anything really that uh, attracted I mean, uh, you so far? Yeah, I've enjoyed it a lot. And and I got to give credit to the CBC uh, News app, which or sorry, sports app, which uh, has provided um, pretty much universal coverage of the sport um you can't pick and choose like during the olympics you can't just watch the pole wall for instance you have to cover what is it's bbc coverage that we're getting uh which is fine but uh you know in a one event uh, sort of situation it's not a big deal to not be able to jump around you're really just not able to focus on a single uh, field event basically uh they go to the track whenever there's a chance it's, it's very similar to how we're used to watching the olympics in the past uh prior to the uh, over the top sort of emergence the last couple of olympics and it, it gives me a lot of hope that uh that tokyo is going to provide us with a lot of great coverage on the various apps here in this country because the streaming has been seamless for the most part a uh, very sharp quality a uh, very consistent uh, reliable uh that's something i've worried about and hasn't always been up to snuff the last few years as over the top sort of emerges but it looks like it's here in full force and i've been able to watch i would say about three quarters of everything so far <laughs> well that's a lot i know i spent a lot of times last night i didn't watch it live but i did watch it almost in entirety the 50 kilometer walk and i thought that was for me awesome and it's unfortunate that it might be an event that's taken away from the world championships and the olympic movement in the future and uh, friends of the show evan dunphy which by the way spoiler alert did win a medal best performance ever bronze medal in the 50 kilometer race walk for canada in the men's race it's, it's a shame that it's an an event that might be taken away i I love those long events. I know they're not TV friendly. You need to be a geek like I am and like you are to watch it. But the tactic, it evolves along the 50 kilometers. It's, it's, it's totally a different tactic. And we saw a lot in that race. And maybe it's the cyclists in me because of the tactics are similar. Of course, you don't have any drafting in race walk because they're not going that fast. But you do have the tactics that are similar. And to me, we're going to miss something if we take off all those marathon, we take off the, the 10,000 meters, we take off the 50-kilometer race. The long endurance race are a sport and an event in itself, and the tactics and everything surrounding them are non 
you can they're different than the twenty kilometer race, and it would be different if it was a hundred. There's something on their own, and I think it would be something terrible if uh, they are taken away from the next world championship after twenty twenty two. No, for sure. And look, I mean, it's the closest thing we have in the Olympic movement to an ultra uh, distance. It is longer than the the regular than the running marathon. It is the longest single distance other than the, that anyone on foot. Um, yeah, like bike is longer, but you bike. Yeah. sorry, yeah. I was going to say yeah, you bike longer, but it's a bike. It's not you're not running. Yeah, yeah I mean, the the triathlon distance would be similar in terms of the overall distance. I actually would be a little bit longer. I suspect I don't know how long the bike is. Fifty k in the bike in a triathlon. Of the, uh, style. Uh, I think a bit less than that, but yeah, I think so. Uh, so someone's probably yelling at the devices right now, but uh, no, yeah. Yeah. O- overall, it'd be a similar distance. So, they, but again, like that's not on foot. Um, and I'm an advocate, as I've said before, we had a show once where we, we talked about what sports we'd like see, to see added to it. And I was an advocate. One of my picks was ultra running uh, because it is its own little thing that's out there. And the marathon is its own unique distance right now. But uh, as odd as this sounds, um, you almost there are people out there that are really, really good distance runners that aren't fast enough to run in the marathon. They don't have enough sprinting skill because it has gotten to that point. So a hundred mile race, which is what the ultra marathon distance would be, uh, I think would add a lot and it, that wouldn't be TV friendly at all, but it doesn't no. matter because you know what? We've got skateboarding in the Olympics. We've got <laughs> break dancing you know, in the Olympics. We can uh, yeah. surfing in the Olympics. There's <laughs> tons of TV friendly stuff out there. We can keep, a road race in. We don't. We're not asking you to put it on your TV. Just give me a feed. Just put. I don't care. Put a fixed camera on. Just on the on the freaking start and finish line, and I watch it. You know, but uh, the race walk itself, the strategy. Suzuki from Japan, Dwayne, uh, starting really, really strong in the 50k, and by the end of it, he was going almost a minute slower than an Evan Dunphy, but and, and like for four straight kilometers, well, four straight lap, he was stopping at the feed, just walking, basically, not even trying to walk fast to take some uh, some fuel, and then continue, but the Japanese Suzuki was able to hold on, Evan Dunphy finished third behind the Portuguese, Vieira in second, I really enjoyed that race, Dwayne. Of course, the elements are were something, and you can see that it was difficult, and there was 15 race walkers that did not finish the race. Uh, I think it's 24 on the women's side, and that's insane, but uh, the event itself, it was, yes, at night, 11.30 on day four, at night, almost midnight, but it was one of my favorite events so far. Yeah, well... Y- for sure, and it helps that we we know Evan a little bit, and, and he is a very outspoken advocate for clean sport. I've uh, been on this program a couple times. Uh, finished fourth in uh, in Rio uh, in a very exciting, dramatic moment on the final game, final day of the uh, the Olympics there in the 50k. Uh, it's the final day, the second final day. It's the final weekend at any rate. So so we're happy for Evan to to get that medal at the world level. Uh, he's he's already had a you know a gold medal to come in the Pan Am Games. I believe he's a gold medal to Commonwealth Games. So so he's had a successful career regardless of whether he manages to get an Olympic medal. But you would certainly think that um, winning the the bronze medal a year out from Tokyo would put him amongst the favorites in the 50k distance heading into uh, 2020. And and we we yeah. are cheering him on. Uh, the local guy will obviously have a lot of pressure on him in that particular now. event. Well, uh, so yeah. Putting race walking on the map for us Canadian too, once again, a pioneer, the best race walker ever coming out of Canada, Evan Dunphy, for me, is an inspiration, never quitting, uh, working a lot with community sports, with foundations and different organizations to raise funds for athletes that, well, young people, future athletes that cannot afford sports. Evan Dunphy, congratulations once again on your bronze medal. But speaking of medal, Dwayne, let's start our medals for today. Let's start with what I had for lunch. Let's start with a poutine today. Our poutine medal, um, I am going with Mohamed, uh, 5,000-meter Canadian. Well, obviously, it's Canadian. It's a poutine medal, a bronze medalist in the 5,000 meters in what was one of the fastest 5,000-meter finals that we've ever seen at a major championship. It, for a Canadian to be involved in that uh, is something that we're not used to seeing. Uh, this is an event that has not traditionally been very successful for, for not just Canadians, but North Americans in general. Um, it is dominated, obviously, by the Kenyans and the um, the East Africans in, in 
more globally. And uh, it was really interesting to see a guy up there that uh, that has really come onto the scene over the past few years. And again, when you talked about Evan and sort of pushing boundaries and, and becoming the first to do things, I think a lot of that applies here as well. Um, he has, you know, other, there are Canada in general and athletics Canada has done a very good job quietly of bringing this program back from the near dead. And, you know, if you go back to the Beijing Olympics, they were almost non-existent on the track other than poor, you know, poor uh, Perdita <laughs> and falling over the hurdle. There was not a lot of opportunity for medals back then. And in the, in the 11 years that have followed, Canada has done a great job and they've done a lot of great work and non-traditional events. And this is a good example of that. So that is where I am going to give my poutine medal. All right. So my poutine medal is a Marco drop from Canada finished seventh in the 800 meters you were talking about events not used to be won by North American. This is another one for the first time ever, an American won the gold medal, the world championship in the 800 meter final. And his name, I cannot read my writing and I can't find it on, on Google. So for now, he's going to be the American who won the 800 meter final. <laughs> and I'll try to correct myself. But my Putin medal goes to Marco Drop from Canada, finished seventh in this competition. 800 meters is one of those distances where neither one it's neither the other it's somewhere in between it's not sprint it's not short distance it's a bit longer but it's not mid distance either but canadian seventh marco drop it's yeah it's getting close to a sprint nowadays uh 142 something was the the time um Look, the, well, we're going to talk about doping a little bit later in this show. There's a you know, black cloud hanging over a few of these athletes, but that's just track in a nutshell. I mean, there's an entire group of athletes that are, um, what are they calling them? The 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 country that has been banned, their athletes are, are under, if you see the little white with AMA in it, that those are, you know, they drink vodka. They're at some level, it's, we'll it's, say that. It's the country formerly known as Russia. I guess yeah. the artist formerly known as Russ. It's a symbol now, yeah. so I guess it's the same as Prince. It's non-affiliated, approved, approved non-affiliated athlete is what it is. ANA uh, is what those that thing is, and uh, they've had a couple winners there. But uh, uh, the black cloud of the, the doping is under this race as well because the coach of the American that won um, served a doping ban. So we'll, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean his athlete is dirty. So let's be clear about that. But no, but it's unfortunate. But it but also it's the it also tells you that at one point in his life the coach went to the dark side. So, so what do you do? Do you, yeah. So there's that. Yeah. It, 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 look, it's it's the reality when you're talking about athletics, track and field is you're going to have to talk about this. I mean, look one little glance at the world record book. They're all from the friggin' '80s and '90s still. That tells you all you need to know. I mean, the world record in the 100 meter for women, which is you know the stain on the sport in my opinion. Um, you know, it's funny how she didn't get caught, but anyway, that's my own bitterness coming out there. Uh, it hasn't been touched. They haven't been within 20 tenths of a second uh, from that world record in the 30 years that have followed. It's, you really think that human achievement peaked at that point? No, it didn't. And yeah. this is something we have to talk about. So look at the nutrition back then. Like, yeah, eat pasta before your competition was what's what nutrition was, which was yeah. terrible for you, by the way. You cannot. Don't don't do that. Just eat chicken and load. no, yeah. exactly. Eat chicken and, and broccoli like two hours before, and you'll be fine. <laughs> Moving on to my uh, wood medal. All right, let's go wood medal. It's the weather, Dwayne. For for me, it's well. The weather is of course it is going to be what it's going to be, but the choice of Doha as a host place for the World Championship, which is going to host as well the 2022 World Cup. Yeah, it's uh, it is what it is. Just long. Uh, everything that is outside, outside, it happens at night, like uh, long distances and running, marathon, the race walk. Inside, you have a certain amount of air conditioning, which is 26, 25 degrees. I've seen what was the temperature inside the stadium outside is 40, 42, 43, humid. And that's why in the marathon, both on the women and the men's side, a very high percentage of uh, did not finish. And also, some people hospitalize after the marathon, and uh, that's the unfortunate part, is that some athletes will just go until they drop, and I guess that's part of the winning at all cost mentality, and sometimes that's how you become a legend. You take, you you get a performance out of yourself that you didn't know was there, but sometimes you're not as lucky, and you end up in the hospital, and that's terrible. 
No, obviously, and you don't want to see that. Uh, I mean, there's one thing to push yourself to a limit. There's quite another thing to push yourself to the hospital. Look, the weather, we all it's not a shock that the weather is, is what it is. We knew this going in. The, the criticism here lies in the fact that they're holding it here. And it is... It is to me, I am a bit ambivalent about this. And I'm, I've had this conversation more on the soccer side where you know, I think most of you know Kevin and I have soccer today daily. So we talk about the soccer side of this a lot, football, for those of you not in North America. Um, the Qatar World Cup is going to be in Doha. Basically, it's the Doha World Cup. All the stadiums are within 50 miles of this place, right? So this is the weather we're going to have in 2022. It's a month early, about, sorry, about six weeks earlier than that. And there have been, excuse me, many people have reached out to me when I made comments about the weather to, to suggest that it's a much different six weeks from now. I have a hard time believing it's that much different, but probably a little, sure, fair. Um, more to the point, though, it, it is a very difficult place for people to go to and to travel to. And it's an uncomfortable place for people to go to and travel to, not just for weather reasons, but for cultural reasons and for um ethical reasons and a lot of stuff and it becomes complicated with do you want to shut this part of the region out completely and then just have them further not connected to the rest of the world or do you want to find a way to include them and that's where i become ambivalent about whether we should be hosting these events here but i do think that if you're going to host events in the middle east in a desert then you really do need to make accommodations for it and i would suggest that it would have made more sense to award Doha the the Athletics World Championships, but with a caveat that the distance events were held elsewhere. And that would be unfortunate for, uh, it would be fortunate and unfortunate for the distance athletes. They wouldn't have felt part of the games, but at the same time, at least they would have had a fair competition, a fairer competition. And and I think that would have been the solution. But also the, you know, people know I'm a cycling fan, big cycling fan, and I'm used to watching long events and marathon, or if you're looking at cycling event, the course itself becomes part of it, right? And I found this course of two kilometers on a flat road, just turning around pylons was kind of boring. And I can only imagine there was a little false flat at some point in the course of the race walk example, but marathon was the same thing. Not enough to truly be a challenge, but, uh, it is something to think about, too, uh, the lack of possibility of having a very intricate course for a race walk. And I know it's the par for the course. Usually it is what it is. It's a two-kilometer loop. Sometimes it's a bit different here and there, and there's obviously other disciplines in the same uh, sport. But, yeah, no, I agree. Maybe having the long-distance sport somewhere else could be an idea if we don't want to have death on our hands in the next few years because this, this problem is going to happen again. Well, let's not it, well, kid ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Middle East is here to stay. The, the money is there, right? And there's, as we've talked about a and lot global on the show... And, and especially global warming, but that, that's something else. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, just keeping it to, to what we can control, right? Like, I mean, it, these are expensive to host these games. You have to have a massive stadium, and, and there's a lot of cities in this world that are no longer willing to spend that kind of money so this is a place that we're going to see games like this and and we have to figure out how to have them so they're safe and it's going to be coming to play in the world cup in 2022 and, and that sort of leads me to my wood medal and, and what i am given to give it to is very similar and it's the crowds they have been terrible i mean that's not you know i'm not trying to knock on Qatari people or Doha as a city because the, the World Athletic Championships was in Edmonton about 15 years ago and the crowds were terrible there too. <laughs> exactly. It's, so it's not just that, but this is a place that's going to host a World Cup in 2022 and a big part of the reason the crowds are so bad in it's not in Europe, but it's it's adjacent to Europe, is because it's hard to travel to and it's not a place people want to travel to and I hope that there is some kind of lesson that FIFA is taking from this to make sure that we don't lose out on the vibrancy of a World Cup crowd because right now I have worries about this. That these that There's going to be a lot of games in the group stage of the World Cup that are played in front of half-empty stadiums. And yeah, well, that's not... So go ahead. I was going to say, look at what is usually in the Olympic game or World Championship the key event that draws crowds. 100 meter. Okay, how many people were there? I think you could probably name them. Yeah. There was nobody there. I, I could see the design. I could see the seats were made of plastic, and I can tell you which year because I could see the number of the serial number on the damn seats on the television screen because there was nobody there. Yeah, and it's part of that's the time of night too. I mean, that's going off at True. about eleven thirty. But 
And this is then what's it has to because of the weather. So it all plays in. Um, again, the, the deal is done. Like anyone who's screaming about Qatar being moved is deluded at it's this point. It's too late the, now. Yeah, so the World Cup is going to be there in 2022. You make your own ethical, moral decision whether you want to be part of it or not. And I suspect that a lot of people that are screaming that they won't watch it are lying to themselves mostly right now because once the games kick off, you know, the stadiums will just be football you're watching and, and you'll watch it anyway. It's whether or not you want to travel there. And, and look, here in Canada, we probably don't face a problem unless we have a miracle that goes in. And then we really are going to face a massive problem because it'll be the first time we've gone in many years. And I suspect that I, like many Canadians that have followed that program for a long time, will pull out my credit card. So yeah. there you go. But And go. <laughs> like, okay, well, how yeah, do I yeah. get that? Canadian Soccer Association, can you help us? When that's a problem and uh, an ethical problem, we'll all have to ask ourselves before we get there. And that, I guess that's the same thing here. All right, it's time to move to the actual medal, our first medal since 2018, since Pyeongchang. Dwayne, your bronze medal for the first five days of the World Championships in Doha. I've already sort of spoken to it, but I am going to give a collective bronze medal to all of the distance runners, whether they won gold or finished uh, or did not finish, because it was a very, very tough thing to face down and to perform into the weather that they had to perform in and to switch their body to perform at midnight that's not natural for a distance runner who used to run it early in the morning not late at night all of it was just an incredibly hard thing for an elite athlete to do and for those that did push through they deserve it our utmost respect regardless of where they finished so i'm going to give a collective bronze medal for the first five days of these championships the first half of these championships to all of the distance runners who have run so far and who are to run yet still, uh, they deserve a big tip of the hat. And, um, you know, especially to the ones that did perform well, but no, yeah. not even especially, but, no, but no, all right. of them. Even all. the ones that did not finish, you mentioned that even if they just finished, even if you didn't finish, I, I applaud you because it was that difficult. My bronze medal is Evan Dunphy. Race walking, 50 kilometers, silver, uh, bronze medalist. His best performance ever, Dwayne. At some point, he was running two kilometers, well, running uh, laps, uh, kilometers at 4.37 minutes a kilometer, 4.36, 4.44. That was a span of three, four kilometers where no human being has ever walked this fast in a competition. And that was quite impressive. And Evan Dunphy, great performance again. And uh, just a year, not even out of uh, Tokyo 2020, one of the candidates for the podium for their 50 kilometer race walk race walk oh for sure and and obviously he will get a big push here in canada over that year we'll get to know his name and i think he's going to be a very compelling story that the the cbc uh was going to tell us a lot about because uh, his event uh, will be at the his best event will be at the very end of the games which will allow them to build up to it a great deal so that'll be fun to watch next year for sure, Kevin. Let's jump into uh, my silver medal, which just happened today. And it's a battle. I'm going to name a dual silver medal to the uh, gold and silver medalists in the men's pole vault. Uh, first, the uh, the Swedish, the young Swedish teenager, Amen uh, Duplantis, which is a great name for a pole vault. Or a plant, <laughs> plant, you plant the pole. Yeah, He's the Plantis. Yeah. It's a weird name for a Sweden, but uh, <laughs> he was impressive. And he's 19 years old. 19 freaking and, years old. And he won the silver medal. Sam Kendrick, the American, won gold, uh, both battling out with a very incredible uh, performance tonight and around that six-meter mark. Uh, by yep. the way, defending champion for Kendricks from the United States, uh, back-to-back world champion in the pole vault. Yeah, the world and clearly the favorite heading into Tokyo. But they, that's – well, though, you know, if you have a teenager jumping is, around six meters hmm. – <laughs> The plant is going to win next year. But you know, you're absolutely right. That was a great competition. It was long. It was full of suspense. Both making like tries in the third try just before it stopped. You think it's over. No, one clears the bar, forces the other one to go. It was uh, quite a fascinating competition. And the jumping events in general have been pretty good. Uh, I think, you know, in high heat, uh, it's a little looser for speed-related events. So I think, and for flexibility-related events, it actually is a benefit in some cases, although there's a limit to it. But you have seen uh, some really good uh, high jumps today in the qualifier. Uh, Canadian got through there, too, as well, uh, for what's worth. Uh, pole vault uh, yesterday for the women, or two days ago for the women, I should say. Uh, Canadian finished fifth in that, if you care. But uh, the Russian uh, athlete, I guess, well, I just put the spoiled yeah. it there. The uh, um, we, Well, 
we shouldn't rip on those ones. If they've actually passed the drug test to get there, I have no problem with them there, right? That's like, true. It's a problem. Yeah, You're right. So, so a formerly Russian, a former Russian, well, she's still Russian, but a former Russian athlete in the track world sense uh, won the gold medal in that at 495. So all of the jumping has been pretty good and, and leads up to what should be a pretty interesting and really tight field. A lot of the it's a deep field is what I'm trying to say, especially the women's side for pole vault, which if you look back to when it debuted, it was kind of only four or five women in the world that were really, truly elite. And now that it's been about a decade, it's a massively deep field because it really lends itself to like to former gymnasts of which it's a very yeah. popular sport amongst young women. Right. So yeah. if you happen to grow out of your gymnastic body, this is a great opportunity for you to continue an elite sport pole vault is. And, and you have seen a lot of, a lot of women have done that and have pushed the heights to that, uh, that side of the gender a great deal on the pole vault. If you're hearing thunder or something on the audio, it's because there's probably like a cyclone happening outdoors. So I'm just not going to pay attention to it. And if you see me fly away, well, you know what happened. So uh, <laughs> moving on, I agree, Dwayne, though. The pole vaulting competition, athletes or gymnasts that are uh, too tall or too old. I guess so they, once they're 17, <laughs> they're too old for the Olympic cycle. I'm kidding. But uh, the aspect of the lower center of gravity for women and the way they jump. And no, it, it's exciting. And jumping sport, you're right, have been fun. Even the long jump has been really fun. We've seen a, the longest jump in 20-something years with 8.92 meters from a, from a young jumper earlier this week. But it's not in my medals. My silver medal, Dwayne, is Aaron Brown from Canada because he's always in the shadow of Andre de Grasse growing up at the same time. The Canadian champion right now, 100 meters and 200 meters, Aaron Brown uh, got... Uh, to, to the finals in the 100 meters and was able to recover in time to make it to the final of the 200 meters, did not medal, but was present in both finals, a young up-and-coming still sprinter for this country in the big shadow of one of the best in the world, but becoming one himself. It should should be a, a fun four by one team as well. Eight, eight nine two in the long jump, by the way. That's Bob Beeman's jump from Mexico, which was one of the most famous world records of all time for for a long time. Um, a complete uh, a complete outlier in the man's career. If you don't know the history of that, you should. If you're new to the Olympic movement stuff, go back and watch that famous famous jump. It's a an unbelievable thing that happened in Mexico City, and the it was very right on the cusp of of the uh, trailing wind and thin air and the whole night. Everything just hit that day. But uh, yeah, that's a very famous distance when, in the world of track and field. When we talk of marginal gains, add them up all together. That's exactly what we talk about. Exactly. So, uh, so that's a that's a world one of those long standing world records that that I'm you know ninety nine point nine percent sure was legit. So that also makes me uh makes me happy. I almost we've had this conversation before whether we should just reset the world records, but cause that's a different topic for a different every, show. Every twenty years, you just hit a button and be like, all right, next. Yeah. Deal. All right, let's move to some shiny and very worthy, valuable metal, gold. I am speaking of, of world records, and I've alluded to it a couple times already. The closest I've seen, the, this is the first time Shelly Ann Frazier of Pierre, the Jamaican sprinter, 10.71 seconds in the women's 100 meter. That is a very, very fast time for women. Um, still a ways off the 10.48, but it, it, to me, this is a person who has it within her to maybe get close and challenge that, and I would just dearly love to see someone take – uh, the other 100 meter winner from Seoul that had her record stand uh, and wipe that off the record book so we can finally put the 80s track and field kind of to bed because it was a record where a lot of people ran very fast. It was an era. And we're very big. I don't know if it was because of cocaine. Uh, whenever I speak about the 80s, I just have this idea that everyone was on cocaine. Maybe maybe well, I was wrong. May, maybe, but they were, but might have also been on something else. I exactly. Don't think we could, the woman is dead. We can say it. She was dirty, but that's yeah. she died a kidney favor, uh, failure, failure in her 30s. Yes. Anyway. Yeah. That's... I don't think it's that controversial no, in 2019 to suggest that the that's women's 100 meter record is dirty but you know you, you, yeah you're right what a, yes she would have been an east german athlete you think we're gonna she would have been protected the same that's something else for another day but uh but yeah so it's a, it's a great choice for gold medal Dwayne. and uh if you don't know which one she is she has the one who changes hair from race to race and i think that's amazing and it brings a lot of of energy and charisma 
to a sport that could be drab sometimes. So uh, it was fun to watch Elian Fraser in the 100 meters. Yeah, and it has been a bit of a down uh, world championship for the Jamaican sprinters. I mean, they're still very good. But compared to the days with Bolt, right, <laughs> it's it's a lot different. It's been a weird championship. With, it's the first championship without Bolt. So it has been a bit odd to get used to that. He it truly was a joy to watch him over a decade. And, and to not have him there it has been a challenge. And, and certainly, you know, there's a lot of talk of who's going to emerge from the shadow. And then, of course, when Chris Coleman won the men's 100 meter, and you'll note he's not listed in our medals. Uh, <laughs> Should we go there? You want to know why? Okay, so why isn't he listed in all our medals? Well, he failed to show up for three uh, drug tests, which as one other American performer put, you're either dirty or you're dumb, and either way you probably shouldn't be representing uh, in, in this at this level. And look, maybe he's not dirty. Maybe he's just dumb. That, and if that's your fight, if that's what you're hoping for, to be stupid, that's, not dirty, that's, then that's, no, that's that's a small win. That's the hill you choose to die on? Like, I'm sorry. Just didn't have my phone and forgot I was needed to go to. The yeah, look, I mean, store. this is the the dirt. This is what's so bad about where doping went, particularly what what emerged in the last few years. Is maybe he's clean? Maybe. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that that there's something suspicious going on here, and and obviously the silver medalist is a man whose name we don't speak speak of, um, and that's because he shouldn't be running. He should have had a lifetime ban. And he somehow wiggled out of it. So, uh, alas, you all know who I'm talking about there. So, yeah. you know, and this isn't me as a Canadian being bitter because the third place finisher is has no accusations against him, and you know, and, was the bronze, bronze yeah. medalist there. But, but his best race, his personal best ever, and which will move, will transition to my goal because my goal is Andre de Grasse, Canadian sprinter, uh, silver medalist in the 200 meters final. Uh, Bronze medalist in the hundred meter final, with his best time ever, nine ninety. He's the fastest Canadian. I don't think a Canadian has ever run. What was the best of Bruni Surin and uh, Donovan Bailey? It was in nine ninety six. That might have been a hundred meters fastest hundred meters a Canadian has ever run on a competition. I, I believe Bailey got into the nine eights when he won the gold medal in Atlanta. Okay, so but still nine ninety. It's like geez, it's it's his fastest time by point oh eight. Yeah, I know. I think if you're under the grass, and most Canadians would really like to see him lower that to about 977, that would be nice uh, for <laughs> similar reasons that we're talking about right now. Um, not just because that would probably lead him to be a gold medal contender. And, and certainly if you look at Coleman's time, and let's just talk about him as an athlete right now, he was very impressive in terms of the times he is running right now. And, and he does look legitimately like he can get down close to what, into the nine sevens, which you know, Bolt was on a different planet. His the hundred meter world record is what, nine five eight. Is it nine five eight? Yeah, uh, so yeah it's in the nine fives. It's it's absolutely stupid how fast it is. But <laughs> putting this into perspective, like nine five eight versus a uh, nine ninety that uh, the grass just ran. Nine ninety eight was the grass's best, which got him a silver medal at the Olympics just behind Bolt. So. You think that wow, it's insane. Nine five eight, but it's, it's uh, crazy. Both, that was yeah. It, the the two hundred meter time he put down it was, it was nine nine one nine, I think. Uh, nineteen one nine, I think. But uh, which is less something. than if you would add to the two ten the two hundred meters together, right? It's, yeah, it's, it, it's it, less it, than that, that. It was more impressive to me, and and well, I think the grass similarly is more impressive in the two hundred meters because they both are sprinters that would accelerate into the race rather than uh, start it really explosively, and and I think that would be the most impressive thing I saw with the grass this week was that his starts have improved a great deal, and perhaps there was a blessing in disguise when he was fighting the injuries, perhaps that allowed him to work on on the sprints rather than opening it full or the starts rather than opening it full up. I'm not sure exactly how he he did that, but that that seems like a reason that he might have been more studied and more able to do that because that has been the weakness of his game. It's why he's better in the 200 meter. And, and certainly you saw him in the 200 meter today uh, where he won the silver medal to, he was closing down. And, it, you know, I, I sometimes wonder whether DeGrasse might be better off as a two, four runner. Um, he's yeah. talked about that in the past and he doesn't seem too interested. In running no, because runner. where's the money? The money's at hundred meters, right? But that's where yeah. the money is. We're not going to lie. And he's one of the most, he's, one of the big figures now. He's one of the big guys on the block in yeah, the world. I, I so. would guess that if there was a 300 meter distance, that Andre oh. DeGrasse would be the best in the world. That, that's my thought. But, yeah. but yes, alas, there is not, unless it's a match race between Michael Johnson and. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, <laughs> a 150, like a 150 meter race, the Sky Dome. Yeah. Seen that yeah. before. Seen that before. Yeah. That was a good movie. I did like the ending of that movie. 
Uh, just before we say goodbye, Dwayne, this is not on our things, but in the men's, there was three Canadians in the 200 meter final. Of course, the grass brown. There was also Rodney. So I, I thought it was fascinating that one third of the entire final of the 200 meters was Canadian. Oh, uh, there you go. Um, yeah, it's look. There has been, as I said earlier, when I talked about the pre medal, the Canadian performance at these World Championships is already looking to be close to their all-time best. Although I don't know whether they're going to get a gold, which will naturally be what people focus on. But they could potentially end up with. I would say that there's a chance they could get as many as seven medals in this. Uh, I believe their all-time best is five medals. Uh, that was back uh, was when Warner was winning medals in the decathlon. So what we're looking at well, about 10 years. Four years ago. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think it was four or six years ago that we won five in that. Uh, but it was uh, – it's been a good competition. It does bode well in the, the lead-up to the Olympics. And, and I do think that – final thoughts on this – you know, I mentioned who's going to emerge from Bolt Shadow, and that is, I think, something that the track world, you know, the marketers in the track world to worry about. Uh, those of us that just enjoy competition will not. But there hasn't really been someone that has jumped up and grabbed hold of the competition in the same way that Bolt does. Even if you look at Coleman winning the 100 meter, he chose to pull out of the 200 meter rather than go for the double, and that might have yeah. been well, you have an Noah Lyles there. You have one of the best right now, Noah Lyles, who chooses not to do the 100 meters too. So I think it's it's a, it's a bit maybe not a coincidence if both yeah, don't want to compete against each other maybe because they know their levels are similar too. Yeah, yeah, and, and look, the 200 is a different race. Uh, I actually think the 200 is a – the 100 is, is the glory event. Like no one's doubting that. But the 200 might be the more – the better measure of, of pure sprinting ability in my mind. That's a debate that you could have. It's a barstool debate really, but, but certainly uh, it would have been nice to have somebody grab a hold of, of that and, uh, and grab hold of this competition and prove it to be their own. I mean, even we'll go back to London, there's no one on the distance side of things that has jumped up and grabbed it either. And that could be a part of the weather and all that sort of stuff too, which means that everything's wide open for next year, which will set up a very interesting Olympics. And, uh, and yeah, uh, I was going to say, yeah, the, the, the weather is going to be, hot and humid in tokyo too so it's not just a it's not just a desert problem yeah, yeah the problem. last final, final final thought i'm going to say is that what if anything has jumped out at me in this competition it's because there hasn't been anyone on the track that's grabbing a hold of the reins and saying this is my world now it's that the field athletes have had a great chance to stand up and some of the the field competitions have been quite remarkable and fun to watch and, and that that's a good good thing for the side of track and field that doesn't always get the attention that the runners do no, I, I absolutely agree, and we'll continue to watch, of course, the World Championship. Maybe Dwayne and I will find time to, to pull off another five rings this week, maybe for patrons only, so become a patron. Make sure you do not miss uh, special bonus shows on our premium feeds. Go to patreon.com slash sports podcast network, as you see on your screen. Become a member of the Two Solid Toots tier, $5 tier, and you'll have our special podcast next time Dwayne and I decide to do a special five rings show, probably covering the world championship on that note we'll be back next week with more probably another round of medals covering the doha 2019 track and field world championships you can follow Dwayne on social media at 24th minute myself at kev Larme, and until next week as always on your podium folks